Hello and welcome back to Sewing Things. Today we have something slightly differently flavored. I would like to introduce you today to Heathcliff. Heathcliff is my research assistant who has been working for me for about two years now. However, I have recently discovered that they are also a very skilled seamster. How does it feel to be on camera? It's a new experience for sure. <laughs> you know, the, the people here are constantly asking me for more sewing videos. So I had a thought that we might give Heathcliff a Heathcliff project. That is exciting. <laughs> Perhaps I might do a little project where I explore the 1890s menswear. Yeah, menswear. Formal menswear. Formal menswear. I haven't studied menswear extensively, and especially not late Victorian menswear. So yes. I'm looking forward to you teaching me some really cool stuff. Well, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> if you've ever looked at a fashion plate and thought, wow, I want that for me but I think I'm the wrong shape for the fashionable silhouette, then you'll know how I felt when I started this project. Now here's the secret. Humans didn't all look like that. Not everyone had those exact proportions and the Victorians knew it. Contemporary tailoring manuals themselves often include instructions for fitting different body types. Each time period has its own priorities, which areas were important to keep smooth or where something would be fitted or loose, but that never excludes anyone's bodies. And that's what I strive for with historical reconstruction, finding a sense of belonging in history. You don't need anything fancy, just fabric, thread, and perhaps a thimble to save your fingers. The Cutter's Practical Guide by W.D.F. Vincent has detailed instructions of how to measure a person for a shirt which go far beyond the ordinary neck, chest, and waist measurements modern sewists might be familiar with. It's like around here. Oh, wow. And like under here. And then there's a mark that's taken here. And then it's just the Colosseum. Oh my God. Like wow, this is not a measurement that I have ever had to take in the modern era. And from these arcane measurements, one must draft a pattern on flat pieces of paper to hopefully fit a three-dimensional person. These tailoring guides are quite light on instructions, such as what type of stitch to use, or indeed, how everything fits together. And moreover, when it comes to putting these pieces to use, you're pretty much on your own. So it doesn't say where F is meant to be, like how far it is down here. I've got it in line with E, but that's not right. And also there seem to be two Ds and no B. Oh! Does that mean that like two and a half inches up? Yes. Okay. It's always tempting to dive straight into any project without doing a mock-up, but future you will thank past you for taking the time to check that the drafting instructions actually worked before cutting your final fabric. Oh, excellent. Yes, lining, cotton. Yes, nothing terribly exciting, but good all the same. Your little hands. I cannot with you. Of course, the mock-up material may well behave slightly differently to the final fabric, but you should be able to sort out any major fitting issues at this stage. Oh, nice. Wait, it actually kind of fits. <laughs> kind of. It's supposed to be like eight inches wider in the um, in the waist. I mean, there is some seam allowance in here too. Yeah, yeah, of course. So this will get cut out. Yep. Nice. Let's we'll see how this works. Yeah, so this is the treadle down here. For this project, I had to learn how to use Bernadette's 1892 treadle sewing machine. This was only my second go on a treadle operated machine the first being my misadventures with the spinning wheel, but I didn't find it too difficult once I found the rhythm. Yeah, yeah, it's very easy. I wasn't ready for precision sewing one sixteenth of an inch from any edges, but I was delighted to find I could sew in a straight line, more or less. Yeah, there you go. My first treble <laughs> machine experience. Of course, since Mr. Vincent so kindly omitted any and all relevant information into how to construct this, 
some head scratching was involved in working out how much fabric in the centre needed to be gathered so that these two fronts overlap, which is quite important when you want a shirt to button up smoothly. The wonders of mock-ups. <laughs> Once we're satisfied with the mock-up, we can start cutting the pieces for the final shirt. That's so many pieces for like one shirt. <laughs> it's quite a few, but if you think about it like each of the front halves has like four pieces. Mm -hmm. The back and then the, the yoke and then the sleeves and cuffs. The fronts each have two layers of interlining within, sandwiched between the fashion fabrics. To make these behave all as one fabric, one layer of the fashion fabric is basted together with the two interlining pieces. Then the interlining is secured in place with a herringbone stitch. This stitch is really useful in this application because it's entirely invisible from the outside. It only catches the interlining layer and the seam allowance. The final fashion fabric is then felled down neatly, concealing the structure within. It's important to make sure you have a right and a left rather than two of the same as I did initially. <laughs> <laughs> what I've done is I've very neatly basted two exactly the same. And it's so <laughs> neat too. Like look at the look. Oh my God, this like hurts my soul. <laughs> it should be like this, but you know. And this is the front of the shirt. So it's important to get it neat. So pick two. <laughs> Hey, he's Cliff. Hello. It's time for an ad spot. <laughs> Come join me. So, so there is this game called June's Journey, and you should download it right now. All right. Okay. What do you know about June's Journey? It's a puzzle mobile game. Yeah. As you play through the hidden objects, okay. it like takes you through the story. It's a very nice and relaxing game and it's it's just, it's colorful and it's nice to look at. Yeah, I really like the 1920s vibe. Yeah. If you would like to join the ranks of June's Journey players, you can go to the link in the description box below. June's Journey is available on iOS, on Android, as well as online on Facebook games. June's Journey have also recently come out with a diary. It's like a physical diary. It sounds really cool. That is really cool. It's full of all sorts of activities from, of course, the gorgeously drawn hidden object scenes that June's Journey is noted for, as well as mazes and cryptograms and coloring pages, word searches, and all sorts of fun activities, all, of course, bound up in this beautifully designed hardcover little diary. So it is the perfect little accessory to carry with you, and I think this would make a gorgeous gift for somebody. The diary is now available for pre-order worldwide. There are limited copies available, so do act fast if you would like to secure your copy. We are all also, here on the channel, hosting a little giveaway, so for the next 48 hours from the time of this video being posted, find the link to enter your information in to win a free copy of this diary. That will run until Monday the 13th of November at 2 o'clock p.m. UK time. Links, of course, to sign up for the giveaway, to pre-order the diary, and of course to download June's Journey for yourself are all down in the description box below if you would like to go forth and check that out. Shall we get back to work? I suppose we should. Yeah, we should get back to work. Yeah. Although the sewing machine was certainly in use by the 1890s and likely was used for shirts that were a staple of daily wear, I opted to do much of the work by hand. I'm much more comfortable working by hand, and the last time I used a modern sewing machine was in my high school days, a good 20 years ago. Sometimes it's beneficial to practice your handwork too. That's what I tell myself anyway. I promised you good footage. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Danny has to deal with this. Hi, just... Danny. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the cuffs are made up in the same way. 
with the interlining herringbone stitched in, before the front and back are felled with a tiny, almost invisible felling stitch. Because it's near the hand, this is an etch that will be visible, so it's important that it's as clean as possible. One set of seams I did machine sew for this shirt were the long sleeve seams. These were French seamed, sewn wrong sides together, turned, and then seamed again to contain that raw edge. The back of the shirt is in two pieces, the main back piece and the yoke. The instructions had me cut the back piece wider than the yoke, meaning that it will have to be gathered down to fit. Since the yoke is very curved, the edges must first be clipped to allow the fabric to stretch around those areas. For ease of management and precision, I ironed the seam allowance carefully to maintain that beautiful curved shape. To prepare to join these, the yoke was then basted in place, an important step so things won't slide around as you're sewing, and the gathers were pinned carefully in the center back of the shirt. Okay, I think we're flat now. Good, huzzah. I then did some tiny back stitching to top stitch that edge down and join the two back pieces together. There is a mysterious dearth of extant 1890s shirts available to view online, so we turned to eBay to find one. This was my first handling of an antique, and I was understandably okay. very excited. Success. Okay. <gasps> Ooh, oh my goodness. Wow. <laughs> this is so cool. The front and cuffs had been starched so much that they were rock solid. It's almost hard to believe that they were fabric. I took meticulous measurements of each element to see how it compared to mine. Of course, there were some differences between them, but it just goes to show that there was no one correct way to make a shirt. Did it belong to a... Mr. Phillips? Phillips? A.W. Phillips, Notting Hill, London. The cuffs are like much stiffer than I thought they might be, which is exciting. And that looks like a hand on buttonhole to my own eyes. Ooh. It has reinforcement triangles at the corners of the cuffs and the gathering is done right at the center. You see, we can do something like that. I think the bib was stitched together at the front. So it wasn't actually designed to be like just in one piece to begin with. This is the edge of the bib from the outside, and this is the one from the inside. And if you look extremely closely, there are the tiniest felling stitches. We're talking several layers here, which is what we've done. We have the little button thing that buttons to the top button of the trousers. So useful. Mm -hmm. Really looking forward to seeing how this can improve my own attempts. After examining the extant shirt, I decided to add some additional reinforcement pieces in a sort of homage to it. The underarm reinforcement pieces and the reinforcement triangles where the cuff connects to the sleeve.
where there's an opening, there are edges to be felled into place and a point of weakness that needs to withstand strain. I drafted some reinforcement patches using the shape of the reinforcement pieces from the extant shirt. These were folded and ironed and felled into place over those weak points. The cuffs are attached to the sleeves by backstitching one side into place, using your interlining as a guide, and then felling the inside edge in. This isn't going to work. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know why I thought that would work. Okay, this was going to be... I found at this stage that my interlining was slightly off on one cuff, so I trimmed it back to make it nice and even. Oh no! <laughs> no, what happened? Where is it? <laughs> Where is the blood? <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> it does help if you don't bleed all over your project when you're sewing, especially white fabric that shows literally everything. But if you do, your own saliva should help to break down the proteins. <laughs> and then no one will ever know. The underarm reinforcement pieces were drafted using the original measurements from the extant shirt, but these were too proportionately wide on my shirt. I had to narrow them slightly to keep enough distance between the shirt front and the sleeve edge, since my shoulders are a lot narrower than the original owner of that shirt. The seam allowances were ironed before I basted the pieces into the shirt and felled them along the outer edge. Since these stitches will be visible from the outside of the shirt, they had to be very small, taking up only a couple of these threads with each stitch. As with the front pieces and cuffs, the collar is treated in the same way. One layer of the fashion fabric and interlining basted together, then joined with a herringbone stitch to keep the interlining in place, before the second layer of fashion fabric is felled neatly down. Instead of being cut all the way down the middle like a more modern shirt, this one is only cut halfway, where the two fronts overlap. So you'll actually see that on most diagrams of men's shirts from the Victorian era, they have gathering, and that's because they are only split to that point. Ah. So in order to function as like a buttonable Right. Garment. Okay. They have to have that. The, the fabric has to go somewhere. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. The fronts are felled to these edges and then all around. Most men's shirts often had a button tab at the base of the button placket or front. I drafted a button tab to the measurements of the extant shirt, interlined it for strength, and felled the two pieces together. Then the all-important buttonhole was cut and stitched. I know what's happened. I know, I know it went wrong. It's because um, the thread twisted as I was pulling it through. Uh, so it didn't yeah. get the nice little knot. That's fine. No one's going to see this. No pressure. Oh, nobody's going to see this one. Not yeah. like the whole internet. Oh, yeah, well, <laughs> shh, it's fine. People can keep a secret, I think. It's amazing how much work goes into just this lower part of the shirt. And of course, no one will see this beautiful phallus. <laughs> oh, that's so tragic. Except, except the entire internet, you know what? Oh, yeah. If we give ourselves the ugly <laughs> things, we have to give ourselves the pretty things. Yes. Now this can be stitched along here. The button tab was positioned at the base of the fronts, on top of the pleats where all that excess material was gathered, and sewn into place with a strong backstitch. So we have our little button tab, and now we have to cover all that up with a little reinforcement rectangle. 
A second rectangle of the same dimensions was also felled down on the inside of the shirt. The side seams of the shirt were another section where I used the treadle machine. These would have taken longer by hand, and there's only a small chance of any mishaps being visible on the finished garment. So it didn't matter too much if these were a bit wibbly. Next, the collar was sewn in. The outer side was backstitched, and the inner side felled as usual. The bottom of the shirt is finished by turning and felling the hem, clipping around the curved edges. Although you might think there shouldn't be many buttonholes in a shirt that doesn't button all the way down the centre, this shirt uses studs and cufflinks rather than buttons, which means more buttonholes than usual. Three down each front, two in the front edges of the collar and one in the back of the collar, and two on each cuff, totaling 12 if we include the button tab for the trousers that we made earlier. Buttonholes can be tricky when going through multiple layers of fabric, and it's always advisable to run a basting thread around them to ensure the layers don't shift around as you're working. A small, spaced whip stitch around the edges of the buttonhole keeps any fibres separate as well while you're working, which is essential when you have interlining to contend with as well. Then, in silk thread, I worked a buttonhole stitch around each buttonhole, covering those whip stitches and the raw edges. Hold on. Ooh, tasty. Before I fully committed to the sleeve positioning, I wanted to make sure the sleeves weren't falling off my shoulders. I almost always find with modern men's shirts that this is a problem area for me. So, with Bernadette's help, we managed to pin these a little closer in. How's that? Yes, a lot better. Maybe that will yeah. um, help once this is closed oh. and you have a collar on. Yeah. And Maybe when that's, that's in trousers and this is being held down, it might be fine. Oh yeah, yeah. Once like those things yeah. are being held in place. We do still have these 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 wrinkles. They're just they're coming from the fact that there's so much whip here. Right. But yeah. which was like added in the pattern. So like following it to the letter, that's what we get. Right. So they like want this side. gusset room. Yeah. Here. So they built the gusset into the arm's eye. But the shoulders are fitting pretty well. Yeah. Oh, that's good. And you can move yeah. arm movement. Good. Yeah. Because I mean, look at all that gusset room you've got. Yeah. Cool. Good. So are you ready to stitch the sleeves in then? I think so. Oh, well, and the inner yoke on the back. Oh, right, 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 yeah. right, right. Yay. The end is nigh. The end is nigh. <laughs> After some adjustment, taking the excess out of the body and not the sleeve, I basted the sleeves into their new position before seaming them in. Then, all those edges were finished with some neat felling. Yes! <laughs> all that was left now was the inner yoke to cover all the raw edges and stabilize that area of the shirt. Basting was really important for this part, as there were a lot of edges and points to line up, and any inaccuracies would be visible from the outside. Then, after a relaxing bit of felling, the shirt was finally done. It's a shirt! Look at it! It's oh my shirt. god, it does. It looks like a shirt. It actually Not does. Not that I doubted your <laughs> shirt making abilities. But it does. Amazing! Look at it! Look at all these stitches. Huzzah! Shall we go starch? Let us douse it in starch. <laughs> um, no, we no. should probably take this to the big laundry pot. Oh, you got the big pot. Big pot. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, this is doable. Is this doable? Do That's this doable. Is, I've done this it before. This is sensible. Here, look. There you go. To get the shirt into a complete, wearable state, there was one step that we still had to do. These shirts would have been starched to achieve the crisp finish required for formal occasions. First, you make a slurry with the starch powder and cold water to dissolve it, before you add boiling water and stir it constantly. 
Are you ready? <laughs> no. Then you must bravely commit your garment to this soup. After it's absorbed as much water as it can, you squeeze the excess out. And finally, while it's still damp, you must iron the shirt to set the starch in. Then, with any luck, you'll have a nicely starched garment. <laughs> yeah, this is kind of the worst like possible angle. The... So I was what like really you... tiny in the background. I think it turned out really well. What was the biggest challenge working on this? This was my first time working with such a fine fabric. Yeah. So I was like, oh wow, when you're folding it, like every fold has to be really precise. Yeah. Did you learn anything? I <laughs> discovered that I really like wearing formal Men's shirt. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's like a complete transformation in you. The way you carry yourself. Yeah. Like the way when you walked out, you were like a whole different person. Wow. Right. <laughs> well, clothing is so transformative, yeah. especially for someone like me. I've never had a shirt that really fits me properly. It does do something to you when you think, okay, I'm wearing something that I made for me. Being non-binary and being able to go into the past and just take any pattern that, you know, there's so many patterns out there and draw some lines on a paper, a piece of paper and cut them out and then look, it's something that fits you. <laughs> there are so many ways that sewing is accessible. There are, there are definitely tricks and things that you need to know, but that's the beauty of like historical interpretation. Like mm -hmm. it is, it is what you bring to it. And sometimes there is something of yourself that goes into any piece of work. Thank you once again to June's Journey for sponsoring this video. Once again, if you would like to download June's Journey or purchase the diary, go forth and check out the link in the description box below. How do you feel? I feel cool. I, I feel <laughs> like I want the rest of it yeah. to be like, you know, truly fancy. <laughs> <laughs> Such is the danger of getting into historical sewing. <laughs> I really like the smallest pair of scissors to do this. Yeah. Look at your tiny stitches! Oh, they're so cute! <laughs> <laughs> A friend. Wow, salacious. Yeah. <laughs>